Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Um, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 546, the new social environment. I'm Eleanor, the programs assistant here at the rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Annabeth Marks and David Rhodes. We are also thrilled to welcome poet Anna Gurton Wachter here to close today's program. And before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our live events, like in our daily NMSU. Um, please check the chat for, more, for a link to donate and more information to support our writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Annabeth Mark's work was the subject of an institutional solo exhibition at the John Michael Kohler Arts Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Other recent solo exhibitions include presentations at Franz Kaka in Toronto, Fahrenheit Madrid in Spain, and many others. Her work has been included in institutional group exhibitions at the Whitney Museum and MoMA PS1, as well as the Rhode Island School of Design Museum in Providence. And New York-based artist and writer David Rhodes is originally from Manchester in the UK. He is an editor at large here at The Rail and has published reviews in Art Forum and Art Critical, among other publications. He's the author of the monograph, Bernard Frise, from Lund Humphreys in 2019 and has an essay um, included in the forthcoming book on the paintings of Peter Bradley to be published by Karma later this year. Um, We're so honored to have you both with us. Thank you for joining us here today. And I would love to pass the mic over to you, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, <clears throat> welcome, Annabeth, and congratulations on a great show at Canada. Um, I was hoping to start by asking you about the, the selection of um, what appear to be two categories of work that they're in dialogue with each other. Uh, if we could see a, a installation view, Eleanor, thanks. Um, I may, maybe move on to the third image, I think. Uh, yeah, that's great. So, um, Annabeth, could you say something about the differences between um, what appear to be two categories of work that um, deal with uh, interiority and exteriority um, in a very specific way when we look at um, this example of these two particular works? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you, David and the Brooklyn Rail for having me. It's really nice to be able to talk about my show with you. Um, yeah, so when I was thinking about um, the installation of works in the show and what would be included, um, I was really thinking about uh, in the room kind of building relationships between different kinds of paintings and, and ways of looking. Um, and it was important to me that in the show, there would be um, these spaces in the paintings um, in these two that we're looking at. There's these kind of central areas that um, in which like the color relationships and the gesture are creating a sense of depth. Um, and I think of them as windows. So I wanted in the room there to be um, work that you could kind of go into um, that would might have reference to landscape that um, would kind of bring in this relationship to the window. Um, and then in other paintings in the show, the kind of central um, rectangle is it's flat color. So it's like very um, exterior and kind of um, 
external. So I was thinking about throughout the room how um, your eye would kind of weave in and out of spaces that you could go into and spaces that really um, made it so that your eye kind of stayed on the surface and with the kind of uh, material complexity that was happening on the surface. So um, yeah, so that was kind of, uh, you know, spread out throughout the room. Um, and on the one on the right, well, and in both of them and in a lot of the paintings I've been making recently, um, that kind of central area is framed by flat color. Um, yeah. So the, the framing, as, as you describe it, is uh, very physical material. And it's very uh, present visually to the viewer. And if we will look a little later at different views, so we can see the sides of the works, because they're, they're very much um, paintings that are considered as objects in the sense that uh, they're not themselves actual windows with a one point perspective that to be engaged in a kind of sensual way by uh, moving a, around them, I, I suppose. But it was interesting you used the word um, uh, weaving in and out because that's very much uh, part of your process, I guess, mm -hmm. that this way of constructing uh, in some of the works that we'll see, um, is the actual structure together with the color of how the work is um, uh, built. But in the, in the case of the paintings we can see here, there is, um, uh, particularly in the painting on the left, um, a layering that's not so clear from a distance, mm. but is actually in a, even though there's a central area that's landscape or, uh, and gestural, uh, the what we're calling the frame or the, the base is consists of um, many moves, many uh, accumulations. It's not it's not um, a neutral uh, neutral uh, zone around the work. It has a lot of um, activity in itself. Uh, could you say something about? The, um, these central areas that the works um, appear to focus on or frame, are, are they, um, do you think of them as um, a kind of abstract painting or are they actually uh, referential to a, maybe a part of the landscape or um, a particular association for you uh, of, a, of a place, say? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I use the term window, which I think brings in the reference of landscape. Um, but for me, these paintings are abstract. Um, I'm not, I'm not using reference material or um, thinking about one kind of specific thing while I'm painting these. Um, I'm not like rendering a representation. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, but the painting, that element of the painting becomes interesting to me once, um, once there is a spatial relationship that does develop where there's this kind of depth and the way that color sits on the surface or recedes becomes kind of in relation to like pictorial depth. And, um, you know, I think of the one on the left is called Valley Pocket. So there, there is a lot of landscape reference happening in the paintings, but um, not in a way that is like from life or yeah. um, I'm not thinking of a specific landscape. Um, and, it, and for me, I really want these areas of the paintings to, um, to kind of continue to unfold and not kind of, um, not kind of just land on like, oh, this is this is a tree or this is, you know, something that you could name that it kind of keeps moving. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's um, great. 
is is the painting on the left am i right in thinking that's the work the exhibition is um takes the title from yes it's also yeah mm -hmm. it's um i can't help feeling that there's a there's a sense that the paintings are sometimes um uh almost um covered in the sense of they're they're even wearing something there's an association with the body in the sense that um uh, the various straps or um ribbon like pieces of canvas could could constitute almost a garment or and then also um it could be an architectural feature too there are there are different associations mm -hmm. but I, I think um the association with a garment the sense of being covered or um dressed in a sense that that's something you've um you've um focused on in in previous work i mean to the extent that there are actually garments that you've used and you've painted on them there um, sometimes within the work and sometimes um, the the painted element is actually um, used as a garment um, a jacket say as the support mm -hmm. Well, we, we have some images of those we can look at um, later, but um, could you say something about this particular piece, Torso, in this yeah. regard? Um, yeah, so um, this was the first painting that I made for this show. And um, usually when I am working on a show, I, I the paintings, once the paintings are finished is kind of when I'm able to kind of think through the language around them and like sifting through language that I um, have in my notebook and through things I'm reading. And so the language kind of becomes composed after. Um, and when I was working on this show and this painting, um, I just kind of, it was kind of more immediate that um, Torso would be the title. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I love all the references that you were kind of bringing in um, of the garment and the body. And those are things that I've been thinking about and working with for many years. Um, and in I guess four paintings in this show, there's, um, there's kind of like a monochrome rectangle. There's like a, a stretched canvas that's been painted one flat color. Um, and then on top of that is this kind of secondary layer that's draped over it. And there are these straps and tabs like you referenced and we can see in this photo um, that really like wrap around the edges. I don't know if we can look at this side view of this painting. Yeah, I think we can, yeah. Um, yeah, perfect. So, um, so there's like this kind of doubling happening on the surface. Um, and I've been thinking about the stretcher is like a torso or a body that's wearing the painting. Um, and um, yeah, uh, for many years, uh, two years, previous to the past two years, I was um, working with garments, like actual jackets. I was really interested in these full length trench coats, which we can look at and maybe talk about mm -hmm. later. Um, but in the last two years, I've been really interested in kind of um, condensing that information that I've taken from working on the jackets and having it um, really embedded in these paintings. Um, and for me, it's really located in, I mean, Torso also references the general scale of some of the work in the show. Mm -hmm. And then also the way in which there's this layering, wrapping, folding, tucking, kind of binding that's happening um, around the stretcher. I think there's a, a very interesting coming together of, um, I mean, for me, I, I look at um, this painting and um, it puts me in mind of um, 
things as disparate as uh, Japanese temple architecture mm. or Native American votive objects mm. or um, uh, ritualistic garments. Um, mm. So, and also maybe bondage and, you know, there's an erotic um, implication perhaps through, you know, through these sort of spiritual themes, um, you, you seem to br bring those elements together with uh, the formal play. You know, as you're saying, they're abstract paintings. They have a lot of associations. And uh, going back to the, um, the near symmetry, there's a play uh, on the idea of uh, symmetry that's similar to the the reality of a, a human body, which is not completely symmetrical, it has its variations. Yeah, uh, I think that um, the symmetry for me really came out of working on the jackets, um, which I was really involved in for about five years and um, you know, so those those were these kind of second skins or containers for the body that we wear that mm -hmm. kind of protect us from the elements. And so I was really interested in following the kind of pattern of their construction and the seam structure on those jackets. Um, and 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 so slowly the kind of symmetry from those pieces, um, I think, has become really integrated in these and um and that and those straps and tabs that wrap around i think have a lot of those references especially when um the word torso is is in your mind yeah. yeah and um what about the scale of the works in this uh, particular show because you've worked worked on much larger um on a much larger scale before uh, and this this appears um, a more intimate scale. Mm -hmm. I mean, as as the experience, say, of the restrictions of the last couple of years during the pandemic um, had an impact on on your relationship to to the use of scale. Has that changed something for you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um... Yeah, previously I was working quite large. I was kind of working between three formats. Um, these jackets, which are body size, uh, like because they were these full length trench coats. And then um, also working on very large stretched paintings, which were about eight feet tall. And then um, these banner pieces, which were unstretched, um, kind of quilted paintings. Um, and, and those were also quite large. So I felt um, I was really interested in thinking about how at that scale, there was this relationship between the body being the jacket and the landscape being the paintings. Um, mm. And there was like uh, this immediate kind of immersion and presence that paintings at that scale have. Um, and I, I was quite committed to it. And, um, and then, yeah, when the pandemic happened, um, I, uh, during the lockdown found myself, um, I was at my parents' house and what I had brought with me to work on um, were these very small stretchers. And I really had not worked very much at that scale. And some, and I had some acrylic paint. Um, so that's, that's like what I had to work with. And um, uh, it was very, a kind of amazing experience for me to work at a smaller scale. Um, I felt like the things that I was trying to do with the larger paintings and the ways I was thinking about how they were objects and um, the layering that was happening um, I felt like all of a sudden I could really actually do at this smaller scale. Um, and, you know, I think like we were all thinking about distance and intimacy and um, I, 
I think that that really kind of shifted my kind of desire in the studio. Um, when I came back to my studio in New York, I was really excited to be working at this scale. Um, and I was thinking about like how the, the large scale paintings really ask that you kind of step back from them to take them in. Um, and at this smaller scale, it was like, they really asked that you get really close to them. And for me, it's also like a more intimate way of working in my studio. Um, so yeah, that, that shift for me in scale, like really came out of responding to the conditions of the world. Um, sure. But it, it opened up all of this kind of possibility for me in, um, how I could kind of take what I had been trying to do and put it, kind of condense it into this smaller work. And um, it's, yeah, it's kind of been like endlessly exciting to work at this scale. Fantastic. Could you, could you say something? You, you are always using um, canvas, do you use other fabrics when you're working in um, in this way um, more recently, not not with actual garments, but with uh, with the canvas, do you use other uh, fabrics apart from the uh, canvas? And, and are you repainting and reassembling? Could you could you describe how you uh, typically um, approach, you know, from from taking the stretcher? How do you um, uh, take the fragments and parts and reassemble and what's that process uh, like? Yeah, um, well, all of these paintings are, um, it's just canvas and um, water-based paint. Um, and I mean, for me, painting is a process of constant revision. Um, and in my studio, I'm always working on many different paintings at once. Um, and I'm kind of toggling between two different modes. Um, one being kind of taking the painting apart, um, cutting it, reassembling it. And then I'm also like painting with paint and pigment and color and making formal decisions on the surface. Um, and actually, if we go back to that green painting, um, thank you. So uh, the ways that I'm like, you use this word accumulation, which I think is such a great word. And, um, you know, I feel like that's kind of what's happening um, on the surface. The way I start these paintings is I'll start with like a very small um, stretched painting, which I'll paint on and then I'll cut it off the stretcher, including its sides. I unfold it and move it to a new surface and attach it. Um, and in some paintings, I'll do that over and over and over again. Um, so there's like this kind of density to the surface that develops and also this kind of, uh, there's like a structure architecture that kind of comes out of that. Um, so you can kind of see the, there are like these bands which come from the, you know, the sides of the stretcher. Um, and so there's another way in which I've kind of developed this process uh, so that um, the kind of um, information, like the, the, the size of the face and the edges kind of build out this structure that I can kind of respond to and it starts to develop patterning that is kind of guiding my hand. Um, but yeah, for me, like making a painting is really moving between like disassembling, unfolding, taking apart, reforming, and then also like very much paying attention to the dynamics of color, tuning color, um, gesture and and pattern and and ultimately at some point all of those things start to interact in a way that's interesting to me um, 
and I, I kind of keep pushing it until it lands somewhere that's exciting. Mm -hmm. Is, is the color associative or are you quite open about using any kind of color? Is it intuitive in that sense? I mean, it's difficult to be rigid about color, but um, do you find you, um, do you find yourself using particular um, ranges of color or when you, when you begin, um, do you have in mind uh, a particular atmosphere or uh, almost kind of a mentality for the piece? So in the one we're looking at, it's, um, it's very uh, green, very green and blue. It's a specific kind of atmosphere. Does that atmosphere develop from the, just from the interplay of working and the constructing and deconstructing that you do? Yeah, I think the atmosphere develops through that. I don't, I don't generally have um, rules I'm following with color. Um, I think I'm, I'm responding and trying to like deeply listen to how it feels and um, making adjustments. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really like, in a painting like this, um, paying attention to like this, the sense of depth that could be developed and framing and um, what colors come forward and, and what colors go back. So there's a lot of thinking between like warm and cool colors, um, uh, like contrasting color. And I am, I'm, I'm kind of like, I use Guerra paint, which is um, this, line of water-based paint in which I can really control the amount of pigment. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm mixing my own pigment with a medium. And so I'm really like thinking a lot about um, translucency and opacity and where the color needs to be really flat and where I want mm -hmm. light to come through. Um, and, and in some of these colors, there's like, a, a, they're densely pigmented. Um, so the color, like I want some of that color to read as like extremely kind of rich and saturated. Right, right. Yeah. And when you're uh, working on a particular um, strip of canvas, does it have a kind of um, independent life before it's integrated into a work? So are you uh, producing um, strips of canvas that you paint and repaint that maybe become as thick as cardboard and others uh, are more translucent before they're integrated into a work. Is there a lot of painting before there's any assembling or does that happen too? Um, well, the, the form like of this kind of layer that's wrapped around the stretcher that um, kind of evolves at the same time that I'm painting. Mm -hmm. um, and it used to be like while I was working on this, it's been through many different forms. This painting had been in my studio for a long time. Um, and it used to have a lot of material between the like grid of those straps where once I kind of cut that material away and it really became the straps and then the central rectangle, the painting kind of started to come together. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's an element also of like, uh, I might be a little attached to a certain part of a painting and think that it looks nice, but if it's not quite doing something that's actually interesting to me, I have to kind of get rid of it, cut it out. And then, um, that kind of starts the painting moving in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe we could see, uh, some more images. Move, move through some uh, more images. <clears throat> Great. Right. There often, uh, it often seems like there's um, uh, two tendencies existing in the same work, two, um, like a, a binary uh, which, which uh, can coexist. It's, um, 
And I, I seem to remember reading, uh, I think you were quoted um, in the press release for your White Columns show, something about uh, a fascination with plants that can be both medicinal and poisonous. Mm -hmm. So something which has a, a binary uh, aspect that coexistent in the same plant or maybe body. Um, is that fascination um, something which is um, extrapolated into the into the work itself? Is it uh, something parallel or was that not really a, something central? Maybe it referred to a, a specific uh, work that you've made. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, there was a painting. I had a show at White Columns in 2017, which was my first solo show in New York. And there was a painting in that show that's very related to everything I'm doing now. Um, mm -hmm that was called The Plant That Heals May Also Poison, which is a title I stole from Ree Morton. Um, and um, in that painting, there was, uh, it was one of the first paintings in which I started collaging on the face of the painting. Um, mm -hmm. And then that kind of framed out, it was this flat orange color and it framed this kind of central area that had a lot of green and, looked uh, maybe more, um, had a more kind of clear reference to it being a window and a landscape with a plant in it. Um, and so that like, yeah, that's a title that, um, and a piece by Ree Morton I've thought a lot about and I really love. Um, and I think in that painting in particular, that was the first time where I was for me, it, maybe it wasn't the first time, maybe I've been doing this for a long time, but I think I'm interested in two things happening on the same surface, um, which I was kind of talking about happening in the room at that Canada show, where um, how, like, how do you look at something and go into it and then also take in the kind of material surface reality and physicality um, and I guess I was maybe thinking of those as being kind of foils to each other. So um, yeah, like working, I think, you know, working between two different modes or ways of looking like going in and then this very like exterior layering uh, material information that's happening on the surface. Um, and um, and then, you know, while I'm making the paintings, I'm building depth and gesture and color relationships, but I'm also like taking the painting apart, disassembling it and reforming it. So I think that's also been something that I is just very central to um, how I think about painting and um, yes. yeah. yeah. So we're now looking at uh, images of a exhibition um, also from 2022, but in Toronto, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is at Franz Kafka in Toronto and it closed in March, so it's very recent. Very recent, yeah. It's interesting that you've, um, you've made a, uh, a painting that's monochrome. It's very interesting to see it um, in dialogue with the two other paintings here and how the blues and the uh, yellows speak to each other. Where, where does the decision come from um, or the desire to, to um, have a work that's one color? It's, it's very interesting because it, um, I was thinking earlier that um, as unlikely as it sounds, I started thinking of um, Louise Nevelson mm. and also um, Al Loving. So people that are not you know, as, as you were talking about these two different uh, coexistent um, ways of making, you know, it's putting me in mind of artists I wouldn't uh, think of as being mm. connected, but but here I'm thinking about it again, you know. There's, um, yeah, those are two artists I really love. Um, 
Yeah, I I was thinking about um, I think in in the last two years I've been thinking more about installation and about um, how like kind of stretching modes of painting out into the room um, and in this show I was thinking there were kind of three kinds of paintings, um, ones that had window spaces that you would go into, and then others that were composed of um, these fragments that kind of are, are always piling up in my studio um, that I was kind of weaving, but, are, that, but don't follow a kind of patterning and structure um, that some of the other ones do. Um, and then also in this show, there were these paintings that are um, more related to like that painting torso where there's a monochrome and then I think of it as as it wearing a garment. So we're, there were these like kind of three um, different types of paintings in the room and then maybe we could go back to the monochrome. I was thinking of that as being this kind of resting point in the show mm -hmm. um, and 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 it was interesting for me once I kind of took away this gesture, you know, any kind of information about gesture or depth or window, and it's just color. It really allows you to um, kind of take in what's hap actually happening on the surface. And this one is, I don't know if there is a close up of this painting, um, but it's like very woven um, and it's like dense and very built up. Um, so the so the blue monochrome really allows you to like actually look at it and take it in. And I was really interested in this blue. It's a blue I use a lot um, in my paintings and um, it feels like very absorbative and very dense and you can really go into it. And then at the same time, it's very bright and kind of projects the kind of light into the space I find. Um, but yeah, it felt, it felt like this show needed that kind of resting point where you could really, even though it's such an active surface, mm -hmm. um, it functions so differently, so much differently than the other paintings. Yeah. The, um... The blank area is extraordinary after the kind of unfolding of um, the strips. There's, uh, there's one area that's um, unmarked or unworked. Mm. That has a extraordinary um, resonance within, within the painting. It's, mm. um, it's a little bit uh, as if there's an absence of um, the the central areas of the light landscapes that you use in other paintings. It's, mm. um, yeah, it's an interesting um, space, and it seems to, in contrast, physically, it seems to animate the the rest of the work. I mean, if the entire work had this sense of unfolding and weaving. It would be a rhythm that, um, or an uh, activity that moved across the entire um, surface. But with that one area, it um, it animates that that woven aspect mm. quite differently. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, so many of the paintings are developed kind of the start of them is just such a small stretched canvas that then gets unfolded and moved, unfolded and moved. So it's like accumulating all of this um, surface information and I'm weaving that together. Um, but I think, so like that central area is really coming through the process. Mm -hmm. um, but then visually, yeah, there's this sense of it kind of unfolding from there and um, I've become really interested in where those are places of rest and where those are like the most active parts of the painting. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we could um, look again at the images of um, 
the actual uh, painted garments mm -hmm. um, again. Great. And are you, were you saying that this is the kind of origin of, in a sense, of the paintings we're seeing in the Canada show, that um, the idea of using a, a central area of gestural painting that's that's on another kind of um, support or ground or atmosphere. Is, is this where you, is this a continuation of uh, something you were exploring earlier or did, is this where, you know, we see it kind of manifest with these actual uh, garments, these jackets? Well, um, my show at Wycombs in 2017 also paired garments with these large stretched paintings. Yeah. So it's something that I started doing. I went to grad school at Bard and my last summer, um, I had this jacket in my studio that I was painting on and taking apart. And so all of a sudden um, there was this tension between this object, which <clears throat> has so much kind of information from the world, you know, these jackets I, I buy them at thrift stores, so they're used. Um, and I, I think that textiles and material kind of really hold a lot of energy and kind of like psychic information. And then there's just like a lot of information embedded in the jackets about like style and class um, mm -hmm. and, and um, construction, like the way that they're made, the patterning that's happening. Um, and so it was really interesting for me to all of a sudden just have this like body information in the studio. Um, and so with my white column show, I was really like cutting the jackets like completely apart so that it was just like this web of scenes. And then I was pairing them with these stretched paintings. And then what we're looking at here is a show, it was called um, We Are the Weather. And it opened in LA. It, like mid February 2020. Um, <laughs> and so this show, um, there were these large unstretched paintings, which I was calling banners, which you can see on the left. And this is like one kind of continuous piece of canvas. Um, the one on the front is this like blue frontal piece. And, um, and then the red on the back is like framing it. And so there is, so also it's interesting to look at this now because I feel like so all of this work in this image is just like so in what I'm doing now, but mm -hmm. it's taken a different form. Sure. Um, but like the, the straps, and I was kind of thinking that the rod is wearing this painting that the banner hangs over. Um, and, and this painting kind of contains its own frame that that red um, really pushes that blue forward. Um, and then, and the title of the show is We Are the Weather. So I was thinking about, you know, bodies moving through the world. And um, these are leather jackets, which I painted, um, but you know, they're leather. It's like another layer of skin that we wear. Mm -hmm. Some of them were quite, some of these objects were quite permeable. Um, and some were very like enclosed and then I would um, pin these painting fragments to them. And there was this phrase in my studio that I was thinking about, which was windowing the body. So mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, these jackets and, and the way that the, these painted elements would relate to them. Um, and also like uh, you can see there's, um, these seams that kind of hang down in in both uh, this banner on the left and some of the jacket works, um, which is totally related to like the paintings. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like I, I made this show right before the pandemic and then, you know, so much changed. And I feel like I kind of found a way for this work to kind of like be condensed into the work I'm making now. Um, it's yeah, a, yeah, it's extraordinary to um, to see actual garments as part of a painting because uh, 
like you say, it they have a a personal history. It's a, a, a quite a remove. It's another form of portraiture in a way, but um, mm. it's not of a. It has a specific history, but but that history is incorporated into the making of the painting. And I um, I was thinking about. Um, when looking at uh, Kater Kater Katerina Gross's mm. insta installation paintings, there's mm -hmm. one form where um, the, um, <clears throat> the paint is sprayed and it's an abstract form and it uh, relates to the room because the room is the support now. But mm. then other times, and, uh, uh, and on one occasion, she took her uh, bed and the books by the bed and the clothes in the room and spread all of them and it, it made it something entirely different. There was still the abstraction of, of painting and the color relationships and the gestures but the fact that there are actual objects there or actual uh, clothes changed the context uh, in incredibly so I think you've um, you've done something similar here. I mean, it's very rare that uh, that a, a thing from the from the, uh, the the lived world can enter a work without it being a kind of um, a quote or something mm. sim uh, symbolic, like in uh, collage. But mm. this, uh, what you're doing here doesn't feel like collage, it feels like another form. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I think before um, I kind of landed on these jackets and before I had one in my studio while I was working, I was really kind of seeking something from, you know, I felt like um, there was kind of nothing interrupting my hand in the studio and I was kind of seeking something from the world with other information and mm -hmm. um, Interesting. yeah it might be nice to just look back at um, that painting torso from the show mm -hmm. Canada after this I'm just kind of looking at um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah we can go back um, these pieces that hang down, um, which totally come from the jackets, I've been calling those extenders and thinking about how they kind of take us out of the kind of internal space of the painting and, you know, which is, I think of as the space of illusion. And then they bring our eye out in, you know, so they kind of move from the space of illusion, like into the room and they're like these physical uh, dimensional objects that then, you know, we have to look at and they kind of help our eye travel between those two different um, zones. But it was just interesting to kind of see that photograph of the show in LA and kind of um, see how much of that is steeped in this work. Yeah, yeah that's very clear. Um, it takes a very uh, different form in the recent work. Mm -hmm. But it's um, its connectedness is is really clear. I wonder if we should um, um, ask for some questions now, having come back to the the show at Canada. Um, do we do we have any? Um, can we open the conversation to some uh, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, first. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Um, thank you, David, for your great questions. Thank you, Annabeth, for sharing all of your amazing insights. Um, our first question will be from GE. Um, GE, you should be able to unmute and ask your question if you'd like. Thank you so much, Eleanor and, uh, and David and, and Annabeth, and, and greetings from the um, unceded lands of the Iroquois in Rochester, New York. 
Um, question is, um, in your in your in these flayed and woven canvases, um, and in the way that they transmit a sense of calm, depicting a healing process rather than a real sense of brutality. Because initially, I was thinking of Titian's uh, flaying of Marseilles. Um, uh, are, are, are they more of an art of becoming and healing um, rather and, and rather than just a sense of being? Hmm. Um, you know, I think that, I think that the ways that I'm taking them apart aren't necessarily, I don't think there's like a violence to that. I think it's about, um, finding something and working through a kind of unknown until there's, you know, watching uh, like something's unfolding um, and kind of coming into being. So I think, you know, you, I think you said coming into being, like, I feel like that's a thing that happens in the studio, but I don't think of it as uh, either violent or healing. I think, um, I think there's a way in which um, the the process is really about watching something unfold and understanding what the object wants to become. And I think there's a lot of like there's a lot of time and energy that kind of gets embedded in the painting through that process that I think then uh, can be felt on the surface. Um, that's not something I can have any control over, but um, the viewer might be able to respond to that. I feel like I, I, I was uh, witnessing kind of an excavations and, and things like mm. that, you know, so yes, but thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to you for that question. Um, I would love to turn the next question, turn the mic over to Carolyn, I think she has a kind of a follow-up for GE's question. Yeah, um, thanks so much. You guys have been so, so interesting. Um, still kind of trying to put together the question, but I think, yeah, I am thinking about rest, but I'm thinking so much about leaving, um, like just the cutting away and this, like the active unsettledness that you've been talking about. Um, and they really read as, bodies, but also cities to me. Um, and I guess, so I wonder if you could just speak maybe a little bit more about that, at, like in terms of the extenders um, or this windowing the body um, in terms of, in terms of like a leaving rather than a staying, if that makes sense. It's similar to you sort of. Um, wait, can you, can you like, Tell me more about what you mean by the leaving. Yeah, like I see them as as unsettled, like moving away. Like it, you know, you're pulling the painting um, through so many different processes, which it's almost like it's looking for its home. Is what I was thinking. Um, and yeah, as G sort of brought up, like I I don't think that they wind up staying, and that's what like that activeness mm -hmm. is so interesting and and the work, um, but I guess I'm trying to think about the leaving or this unsettledness in terms of like either the the extenders, the straps, um, or what that means for like the weather and this windowing the body, um, something like in constant motion. Um, hmm. I don't know, that's too unwieldy. <laughs> no, no, I really love what you said. I'm just trying to think about how to respond to it. Um, I, yeah. Um, I mean, I think the activeness that you're responding to is um, there's a way in which I feel like the paintings um, through like the amount, there's so much like evolution that happens in the studio. And I find that some of the paintings um, can then contain this kind of presence that um, I think comes from um, all of the like shifts and, and um, uh, 
yeah, there's this way of like working through them and they become, they, they are so many paintings before it kind of arrives at its final form. Um, and sometimes like there's this painting in the show um, that called the resonator that I feel like really has all of that kind of energy embedded in it. Um, and then this other thing popped into my head as you were talking about the thing I said about windows, which is this um, quote, I think from Joan Snyder, which was something she said about how um, humans, like that we carry our landscapes around with us. That's something I had written on my studio wall for a while. Um, so maybe that's in there somehow. I don't feel like I'm really answering your question, but <laughs> that's what I have. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, that was awesome. Um, next question will be from Nick. Um, Nick, if you want to take the mic. Sure. Um... Sorry, it's kind of <laughs> odd to start with an apology. I don't mean for it to sound too simple, but I'm, I'm just very curious, um, Annabeth, how you sort of treat one media like another and kind of play with how, how we see or treat that given medium. Um, and to that end, and, and as far as influences, I'm just curious in terms of what you're reading or what you're watching or, or specific films or, or something outside of painting that may be a big uh, influence on your work. Mm. Um, like outside of art historical references. Or pop culture, whichever. <laughs> not, to, not to guide you there, I'm just curious. Uh, um, I, well, I've been looking at a lot of quilts, um, Amish quilts and like Jeez Ben's quilts. Um, and textiles generally, um, there's kind of like a, a web of uh, painting references, um, painters I'm really interested in. And then music, like I, I've gotten into this ritual in my studio where when I first get there, I like to listen to medieval choral music. <laughs> and so I do that like, first thing when I arrive and that kind of sets the tone, but then I end up listening to like um, reggae and hip hop and folk music. So I, I'm also, um, the energy in the studio is shifting through the music that I'm listening to as well. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Love choral music, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for the question, Nick. Always great to hear about what's inspiring awesome artists. Um, I think that that was our last question. Um, so I think we can now move on to the poet as for our tradition here at the Royal. Um, today, I am thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Anna gurton Wachta, to the stage. Um, Anna is a writer, editor, and archivist. She is the author of the full-length collection Utopia Pipe Dream Memory from Ugly Duckling Press and seven chapbooks, most recently mid My Midwinter Poem from Clones Go Home in 2020. Her work explores imagined communities, feminisms, and transformative influence. Anna edits and makes books with Double Cross Press and works full-time for the Keith Caring Foundation and part-time for NYU. Thank you so much for joining us, Anna. Um, so thrilled to pass the mic to you. Thank you so much to The Rail and David and Annabeth. Um, that was a really super interesting and I'm just glad to get to learn more about your work and your process, um, especially since I have not been able to go out too much um, to, see, to see art in person. Um, I'm just gonna read two poems 
Uh, thank you all for listening. I walk past the fish store. The nail salon fumes radiate out. The sign in front of the wine shop says, we stand with Ukraine. I sit in front of the overpriced smoothie chain. Some teenagers are smoking weed out in the open right on the main crowded avenue. I start to wonder if they will erroneously believe because weed should be legal and did become legal that other things that should be will become. While I'm thinking this, one of them walks over to the other, puts his head into her lap and lets his head rub back and forth against her crotch while holding her thighs powerfully with both hands. Then he looks up at her and says, why don't we hang out anymore? And without waiting for an answer, walks away. She is smiling. I imagine she's thinking about how they should all get high more often, a little blissed. I feel stoned just watching teenage hormones fly. Then I walk over to the supermarket to get a few things, feeling very faux adult, like any moment someone might remind me I'm not real. I notice a man flailing his arms, kicking his legs as he walks the aisles, knocking over the tea. A group of customers has gathered nearby. I overhear them say, I don't think he can help it, can he? Is it a condition? Trying to understand voluntary and involuntary movements, impairment and unusual behavior. On my way home, I hear some kids, one of them says to the other, I like it when we like to see each other, when we feel good and it isn't weird. How do we make that happen more? I smile a little listening in. I've lost the ability to be this direct somewhere along the way. We see a man who attempts to get his key into the hole of a door but his hand keeps jutting towards the completion of the task and then just as forcefully moving away from it as if there is a force field pushing him back, he fights an invisible barrier of getting home. These two men and the people who witness them, the teenagers and the boldness it takes for them just to be themselves, somehow it all gets me thinking about art and agency, the way everyone almost looks like dancers, a performance on uncommon stages, purpose scratching at ability, why it matters, like when you do some act and also happen to be on a lot of drugs, people might say, gee, you're really high and try to discount you, give you an easy out. None of this is true, they offer. You didn't mean it because you're so high. Like when someone makes some really great art and people say they aren't the real creators, they have a whole team, they're just making what someone told them to make, fabricators, assistants, advisors, coaches, as if anyone is ever alone and the imagined identity of the one who gets to pull the strings. We all like to feel a sense of sincerity, even when we've stopped believing sincerity is possible. What comes out of you questioned and balked, taken apart, rebuilt, pretense to a casual language that lets you feel I'm just talking, right? In the New York Times today, they quoted David Mamet saying that the New York Times used to be a newspaper and wondered if people will still go to see his plays. A theater professor is quoted saying he couldn't not teach Mamet. He is too important. And I'm reading this article very closely with all of my attention, even though I've never seen a David Mamet play, couldn't tell you what one is about. But now I want to find out because they say nobody can resist the plays, even though he is unlikable and his politics are bad. And for some reason, it reminds me of when I was waiting tables. Diane Wiest told me that she lives in the same building as Thomas Pynchon and that he wants people to know who he is. He wants to come out as himself, but his agents won't let him because it has been too long and people like that he is an unknown figure. Diane Wiest said, isn't it surprising that all of these waiters in this restaurant are dancers and not actors? I'm neither, I told her. I don't know what to do. That's good, she said. Not knowing is important, too. And I'm just going to read one more poem. I got a letter in the mail from this guy who keeps writing to me. I've never responded. He just keeps sending more letters. 
Today, it made me think about how anything can end up in someone's archive, seem relatively important or as if a close relationship existed on the basis of not being thrown out. I was once doing research in an archive and I read a letter someone had written from jail just to tell this person, hey, just so you know, I think you're a piece of shit. I laughed a bunch and then thought about how usually I picture a letter from jail being pleading, woeful, humble, despondent. I thought of those times when I've bought a homeless guy a sandwich and he's been like, nah, I hate this sandwich. Go and get me something different. It's a bit surprising, off-putting even, because I expect these people to have lost so much of their humanness that they will accept anything, not have preferences or likes, only be grateful. The other day I stopped in front of a violin player in the park and listened while my son, who had never heard this instrument before, held my hand and looked up at me. When the song was finished, the musician told us that the song is called New York Has Had a Rough Week. Flowers were hanging over his head, more people stopped to listen. A man came and stood directly in front of me to record the musician on his phone from the exact angle and distance of my eye's vantage point. I realized then that a mother and a baby aren't really a part of the city. They live in a separate world. We aren't a part of whatever is going on and it exacerbates a feeling that has maybe always existed. In the background, what is a city? Am I experiencing it when I stay in bed all day? Am I experiencing it when I learned that this person I used to love has lived here for years and I never knew? I don't avoid the streets where bad things have happened. New layers of people obfuscate that feeling, longing, a tracing done over an image, outline matched but shaky sky, expansive mind. Nothing is ever the same enough to be convincingly left behind. Thank you all so much for your attention and um, hope you all enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, Anna, that was amazing. Um, and thank you everybody for being here, for joining us today. Um, of course, thank you again to Anna Beth and David and we'd also like to thank Annette and the extended team from Canada to, for helping us to make today's event possible. And we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we will upload today's conversation shortly. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for our 83rd Radical Poetry Reading hosted by Charles Theonia, featuring poetry read by Nazareth Hassan, Darika Shields, Oki Sagumi, and Nora Treat Baby. You can now turn on your mics and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Anna Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna Beth. Thank you, Anna Beth. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. That was a great reading. Thank you reading. for the beautiful reading. Take care. Thanks, Anna. Take care, you guys. Thanks, Come see the show. Congratulations on the show. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everyone.